from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. I want to speak tonight on the home. In the 11th Psalm, there's a familiar passage that many of you know. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations be destroyed, and the foundation of any society is the home. And then a verse that goes with it, 82nd Psalm, these words, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the world are out of course. Doesn't that sound like our day? All the foundations of the earth are out of course, and we're walking in darkness. We're stumbling. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, and he could bring light. Now, there's someone that has, I've had the privilege of sharing a home with for 42 years. She's the mother of our five children. She's the grandmother of our 16 grandchildren. She's on the platform. She could not be here most of Mission England last summer because she's been in and out of the hospital. Nothing terribly serious except uh, she had to have a new hip put in and she had to have an operation on her esophagus because, uh, well, several years ago, she was fixing a swing for the grandchildren and she fell out of a tree and broke a number of bones and disoriented her insides. And she's now well for the first time in a long time. And uh, she coughs still a little bit. And I've asked her if she'll say a word. And she's a little bit nervous that she might cough. And if she does, just wait. She's got something more to say after that. So uh, I'm going to ask Ruth to come. People, people many, many reporters ask me, who is the greatest Christian I've ever known? I always answer, Ruth. She is the greatest Christian I've ever known. No, but happy, caring Christians have been a part of my heritage. In 1916, my parents landed in, in Shanghai, China, and spent the next 25 years of their li lives serving the people of China as medical missionaries. It wasn't easy. Those were troubled times with wars, disease, bandits, floods, and famine. And yet, because of them, we never knew what fear was. Daily in the home, there were family prayers with hymns, and scripture reading and prayer. We were lovingly disciplined. We were tr carefully trained. But not only did mother and daddy teach the Christian faith in the home, they lived it. And as a consequence, it was easy as a child to give my heart to the Lord Jesus. Later they came to the States and we had the joy of living beside them for the last 25 years of their lives. And because of their Christian example, our five children were tremendously influenced. And due in a good part to them, they too gave their hearts to the Lord Jesus. I remember the last year of his life, Daddy was elected moderator of our church. Now, he wasn't well at that time himself, and my mother had had a stroke and was in a wheelchair. But well, one morning I went down to check on them and Daddy was on his knees in front of Mother helping her put on her stockings and he glanced up at me over his glasses and he said, you know these are the greatest years of our lives. Caring for your mother has been the greatest privilege of my life. And the thing was, he really meant it. And so I thank God tonight for a Christian home and for what it has meant to me, to our children, and if you haven't had a Christian home, you can give your children a Christian home. And if your children have already grown up and left home, you can recommit your life to Christ and look around for some other young person to help. God bless you tonight. Thank you.
That's the first time she's spoken in public in at least a year or 18 months. And I'm very thankful. I think all of us are aware that something is wrong with our homes. Now, someone has said that all weddings are happy. It's the living together afterward that causes all the trouble. And there's some truth to that. An American psychologist says, marriage is a quiet hell for about half of all American couples. Now, what is wrong? Can the tide be reversed? Because the same could be said perhaps about the United Kingdom or the Ireland, wherever people are watching or listening. And I want to ask you this question on the scripture that we read. Is your home built on a solid foundation? Is it when floods of sorrow come or the waves of temptation or the gales of adversity? of war, death, a judgment strike? Will your home stand? Is the foundation strong? Social researchers are finding that in times of stress, rather than bringing families together, many marriage partners find it easier to flee from the struggle with the overwhelming emotions that family tragedies generate. One of our most famous families got involved in a terrible tragedy a few years ago. Their daughter was kidnapped, and they stuck together, and they prayed together, and they worked together, and they paid out thousands of dollars. And finally, she was rescued after about a year or two. But soon after she came home, they divorced. The emotions, the stress, the strain was too great, and that family broke up. Now, the Apostle Paul was ministering in Corinth, which was a hedonistic city, a pagan city, an immoral city. And he said this, he said, Let every man take heed how he builds, for of the foundation can no man build except that which is in Jesus Christ. If you build your home on Jesus Christ, the problems of the home are going to be far lessened and the problems of divorce may never come. We have found in a survey in the United States that where there's Bible reading and prayer and church attendance in the home, we only have one divorce out of every 300 marriages. But the national average is almost one out of every two, which indicates if you build it upon Christ, that's the answer to the breaking of the home today. Now, Christ was born in an earthly home, and he lived under parental discipline. His first miracle was performed at a wedding ceremony. Christ's father died when he was young, apparently. There's no mention of him after he was 12 years of age, so maybe Jesus Christ, being the oldest son, was the breadwinner of the family. I don't know. But he knew all the problems of the home, and a favorite benediction of his was upon entering our home was, Peace be upon this house. And Jesus said that the entry into the spiritual family is like the entry into a domestic family. It's through birth. He said you must be born from above. You must be born again. Born into God's family. You were born into the present family in which you live or another family but you're born into God's family also. If you want to get to heaven, if you want to have your sins forgiven, if you want to know that you have eternal life, you must be born, born into God's family by repentance of faith and receiving, by repentance of your sins and receiving him by faith. Now, Jesus Christ advocated household salvation. To Zacchaeus, he said, this day is salvation come to your house. And whenever he saved or healed someone, his first concern was that they go home and tell their family about it. Some of them wanted to follow him from that day on. He said, no, go and tell your family. Go back and tell your community. Go tell others. 
to the restored demon-possessed man, his command was, return to your own house and show what great things God has done for you. And perhaps some of you are here tonight just embarking on your married life together. Maybe you're here on your honeymoon. And you could give one another no greater wedding gift than a young couple did the other night here at this stadium. They'd just been married, and the first thing they did was to come to this stadium and come forward and give their lives to Christ together. They said, we want to start our married life with Christ. That could happen to you tonight. Maybe you've been married 20 years or 30 years or 10 years, whatever, but you've never done that. Now, first, a successful home must be founded on a divinely ordered marriage. Remember, God performed the first marriage. Adam and Eve had an ideal marriage. Adam didn't have to hear about all the other men she could have married. And she didn't have to hear about the way his mother cooked. <laughs> if we disregard the, God's suggestions and regulations for the home, it is in danger of ending in failure. But many people are reluctant to make a commitment. Physical love is not enough. It's commitment that carries over the difficult times. When you get married, you're committing for life. It's commitment that's kept Ruth and me together in times of stress or strain or difficulty. We wouldn't think of being separated or getting a divorce no matter what the problem was. Maybe she has, I never have. She once told someone she'd thought of murder, but not divorce. Now, another cornerstone in the successful home and marriage is a spiritual exercise. Prayer, Bible reading, fellowship with other believers. In Deuteronomy 6, it says, and these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart and you shall teach them diligently unto your children. Do you say grace at the meal? Do you say prayer at the meal? Do you have prayer in the home? Do you and your wife ever read the Bible and pray together? And then thirdly, a successful home must be founded on a dedicated husband and father, as we've already said a moment ago. I heard about one clergyman before the children were born who wrote an article on the Ten Commandments for raising children. After he'd had the first child, he wrote an article and he changed the title and he said, 10 suggestions how to rear children. After the third child, he wrote 10 hints on how to raise children. After the fifth child, he didn't write any more. Now, I used to be very authoritative about how to rear children until we had five. And I let my wife take over from there. And she did a terrific job, let me tell you. It's a big responsibility. When a man loves his wife as Christ loves the church, it's easy for the wife to submit to the husband. The image here is not of a mighty potentate sitting up on the throne and ruling his subjects with an iron hand. This is more like a conductor standing on his box directing a symphony, delicate but subdued. Is that the kind of a husband you are? The Bible says live joyfully with the wife of thy youth. It doesn't say go out and get you a younger woman. It says live with the wife of your youth, the one you married when you were young. Be faithful. How many men when they reach the age of 40 or 50 or 60 want to prove their virility and go out and get some young thing? That's not commitment. That is a sin against God. I read a newspaper story where it discussed several recent movies that deal with adultery as a positive growth experience. Don't you ever believe anything like that? That'll destroy our culture as quick as anything. The Bible says that unfaithfulness is the pathway to hell. And then fourthly, 
A successful home must have a devoted wife and mother. Napoleon said the greatest need of France was mothers. One of the vices which is hitting our wives and mothers today in the world is alcoholism and drugs. You see, they don't have Christ to turn to. And when you're rearing children, and when you're married, you need a resource. You need help. And that comes from God, a relationship to God. Just as the husband, to be the right kind of a husband, needs Christ, so to be the right kind of a wife or a mother, you need Christ. And so many don't have Christ, so they turn to something else to help them. A Christian home has a devoted mother and wife. Now, I know that in a place like Sheffield, where there's a, or Yorkshire, places in America like in Michigan, where there's great unemployment, women have to go to work. And I want to commend you for helping in the home and being willing to sacrifice by earning to help in the home during a time of depression or recession or lack of income in the home. And then fifthly, a successful home is based upon disciplined and obedient children. Now, children can absorb any amount of love and discipline as long as the two are kept in balance. I heard a psychiatrist say at Columbia University many years ago in the United States, he said, if your children rebel, keep their love at all costs. They'll come through it, and when they come through that period, the love will be there, and you won't have to reestablish anything. The Scripture says, train up a child in the way he should go. Not the way he would go, but the way he should go. And we're to do it by setting an example of love and discipline together and in balance with each other. And when he's old, the Scripture says, he'll not depart. He'll come back someday. Like the prodigal son, the father never gave up loving the son, and he came back. Your son, your daughter will come back if you've trained them correctly when they were children and lived an example of Christ in front of them. But if you haven't lived an example in front of them, don't expect God to do great miracles. He might. He will, as I'll show you in just a moment, right here in Sheffield, what he's doing in some families right now. Your social and domestic responsibilities make your individual response to Christ that much more significant. On the other hand, if you're here with part or all of your family tonight, and the Lord says to you as he invited Noah, come thou and all thy house into the ark. The scripture says, come, husband and wife, come forward together. Father, son, come together. Daughter, mother, come together. Whoever you are, if you hear the still small voice of God within prompting you, saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Come as a family or come alone. But don't leave here until you know Christ because you can't be the right kind of husband and father. You can't be the right kind of mother or wife or child in the home without Christ. And once you've heard the message as you've heard it tonight, your responsibility is so great because he says, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. He that hardeneth his heart being often reproved shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. Here's a letter that says, Dear Dr. Graham, I had to write you to tell you this time last year my divorce papers were through. My husband was a minor on strike. My children's lives were in tatters because of my own sins. My young son was turning to crime at 13 years of age. My daughter was emotionally hurt, coping with my sins and unemployment after finishing college. For years, I'd been delving into the supernatural, reading cards of fortune and rapidly going to hell. 
I reached it when my marriage smashed and I thought it was my life to do what I wanted with. It was not always like that. We'd had a good marriage for 21 years. A bus with Billy Graham worth listening to kept passing my husband on the minus picket line. It bugged him, tormented him, hounded him so much day after day that one dismal rainy night, he took me along to hear what this Billy Graham fella had to shout about. The divorce was almost through. My son was due in court. I went in anger thinking it was all so stupid. But Jesus cracked me that night. I broke my heart before him. I gave my life a year ago to one of the relays. She was in a relay. And I was born again. Three weeks ago, my husband was baptized. Saturday night, my daughter gave her life to Christ at Bramall Lane. My son didn't come, but gave over his life six months ago. This year, I'm a counselor, hoping to be God's servant. Dr. Graham, I know this will be thank you amongst thousands, but thank you for giving God's word last year on the brink of this family's near total destruction. This whole family is reunited in the love of God. It's not been easy. We have all had to hand things over to him, but oh my God, what he's given us in return. That's one family. And we have hundreds and scores of letters along similar lines from last year's mission and this year's mission here. What about you? I'm going to ask you to come tonight. You say, what do I have to do? I'm going to ask you to do what we've already seen thousands of people do. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say, I'm a sinner. I need Christ. I want him to come into my life. I want him to come into my home. I'm ready to surrender and commit myself totally without reservation to him. But why do I ask people to come forward publicly? Because every person that Jesus called publicly, I called, he called publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. There's something about coming forward publicly like this that makes it real and genuine in your life. So I'm going to ask you to get up right now and come. If you come from that top stand up there, it's going to take two or three minutes. So start right now. And you along here and back here and all over this great stadium, you get up and come. We're going to wait on you and surrender your life to Christ. Maybe whole families will come. Maybe husbands and wives or sweethearts will come. Just get up and come. We're going to wait on you right now, quickly. On your television screen, there's a number that you can call for spiritual health and counsel. People are standing by, ready to talk to you from the Word of God about the problem that you face, about the decision that you need to make. We want to help you. If the line is busy, just wait a few moments and call again. Make that call now. watching by television you can make your commitment just now as you see hundreds of people are coming here to make their commitment in Sheffield in South Yorkshire England you that are watching in America you can pick up a telephone and call that number that you see on the screen in Canada or the United States 
and their counsel is standing by to talk to you. And if you get a busy signal, call again. They'll be there all evening and give your life to Christ. Maybe a whole family will give their life to Christ tonight on that telephone. We're going to pray for you as you make that commitment. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. You're invited on a journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. Retrace Billy Graham's path from humble farm boy to international ambassador of God's love through multimedia, photos, and memorabilia. But the fruit of the Spirit is love! Tour the restored Graham family home place, browse Ruth's attic bookstore, and have a meal at the Graham Brothers Dairy Bar. Enjoy special exhibits, events, and seasonal activities for the whole family. Admission is free, so come walk this journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want to take as our text tonight a passage in the 12th chapter of Hebrews. These words. And this word yet once more signified the removing of all those things that are shaken as of things that are made but those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Since we were here in the 50s and then in the 60s, things have changed. I was asking Joe Ulrich a moment ago, I said, don't you all still have street cars? It seems to me I've seen one since I've been here. And he said, yes, they've just put them in. And uh, I thought, well, that's the first city I've been to in a long time where they had street cars. The last I can remember was in Bucharest. They had street cars and it took me back to my boyhood and childhood when we had street cars in our town of Charlotte, North Carolina. But many things have changed since we were here. And those of us that are senior citizens can really see a change in Portland. Things that you younger people take for granted. We were born before television, before frozen foods, before antibiotics, before nylons, before Xerox, before credit cards. For us, time sharing meant togetherness, not computers. And software wasn't even a word. We were before pantyhose and drip dry clothes, before ice makers and dishwashers, Cheerios, instant coffee, decaffeinated anything, and, Mac and McDonald's had never been heard of. And I don't know how we lived. If we'd been asked to explain CIA, VCR, UFO, ERA, NFL or JFK, 
we, we would have said, well, that's alphabet soup. <laughs> when you think of how our world has changed and the adjustments we've had to make, today's senior citizens are a pretty hardy bunch because we came along through all of that. There have been great political changes. Hungary. We win the People's Stadium in Hungary about three or four years ago, and it had the largest crowd in its history to hear the gospel. 115,000 people in one service. South Africa would have never thought of having an integrated service in those days. We went to South Africa. We did not go until they guaranteed we could have integration. And we went there. And we can show you on film where the newspapers had headlines saying, Billy Graham says apartheid is sin. And uh, then there have been gigantic geophysical and ecological calamities across the world. I read last Sunday's Earth Week column in the Argonian, a diary of some of the things that happened on the planet last week. It talked of tropical storms last week, like the worst hurricane to slam into Hawaii in this century. It continued to report on the damage from Hurricane Andrew in Florida. Norman Mitsky's house, who is on our team, uh, looked like some giant hand had come down and just lifted the whole thing up and lifted everything out. We went to Homestead in southern Florida, and my son, who's here tonight, Franklin Graham, has an organization called Samaritan's Purse, and they had already gotten 10 trailers in place down there by the time we got there to see it. And what a devastation that was. You cannot imagine what happened in southern Florida. You can't see it on television. Stefan Nelson, my grandson, spent his full time down there working, handing out water and bread and uh, things. And he saw on top of one roof this sentence that somebody had written. Okay, God, you got our attention. Now what? And the newspaper went on to mention Typhoon Sybil, the tropical storms, pain in Roseland. Monsoon floods washed away entire villages in North India and Pakistan, killing thousands of people. There were earthquakes in Zaire and Nicaragua and minor shakes in many other parts of the world. These are just the things that came out of one newspaper. This is all in addition to environmental changes such as the sudden drop in levels of protective ozone over the Antarctic mentioned in the column that might signal major damage. I could go on and on. And that was just in your newspaper last week. We're living in a changing and increasingly dangerous world. That's the point I'm trying to make. It's not getting better. Do you have a purpose in your life and does life have meaning to you? Or is your life cracking up and going all to pieces? The big question today is, what is meaning? Fifty years ago when I started preaching, the philosophical question was, what is truth? Today's question is, what is the point? The Bible says the heart is deceitful, above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Your heart, my heart, is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who would believe that after a storm hit Miami and southern Florida like Andrew, that there'd be looters taking advantage of it? I read an article in the Charlotte Observer last week that domestic violence cases are soaring after the hurricane in southern Florida. We don't know our hearts. We don't know what would happen until it actually happens. Andrew Morris, the great philosopher in France, wrote, the universe is indifferent. Who created it? Why are we here on this puny mud heap spinning in infinite space? 
He said, I have not the slightest idea. And there are many people that take that attitude. Albert Camus, who was the great philosopher that everybody quoted a few years ago, said, man cannot live without meaning. Are you trying to live without meaning in your life? Now here are some of the things that the philosophers were saying that people think about when they're alone. When you're alone, here's what many people that are here tonight think about. First, you think about, well, I have to suffer. Maybe now or soon. I must struggle to make ends meet. I must struggle in my marriage. I must struggle with my girlfriend, my boyfriend, because it seems that things are going wrong. I must struggle to make grades in school. I'm at the mercy of chance. I feel guilty all the time, and I don't know what I'm guilty of. I ask the question when I'm alone, who am I? I know that I must die, and I'm afraid to die. I don't want to die, but I know I'm going to have to die. Every person in this audience 75 years from now will be dead. A scientist recently asked the question on television, who made the earth? Why is it here? What is its future? We have the answer. We just don't know. Then he said an interesting thing. Perhaps we're all going to have to restudy the biblical accounts. And that's exactly what many atheists are doing today. They're restudying the biblical accounts. The first time I met Mr. Yeltsin in the Kremlin, I talked with him, and he told me that he'd been an atheist. But he said, I'm no longer an atheist. He said, I've come to believe that there's something beyond this life and something bigger than we are. And he said, I've started going back to church. And he said, my grandchildren are wearing crosses around their necks, and I'm glad. Now, that was a couple years ago before the coup. <laughs> T.S. Eliot once wrote, Where is the wisdom? Think of it now. Where is the wisdom that we've lost in knowledge? We have a tremendous amount of knowledge. We have universities by the scores and hundreds and thousands throughout the world. but we've lost wisdom in the midst of all of our knowledge. Jesus said, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity. In Luke 21, 25, distress. That word means that we're pressed from all sides. And perplexity means no way out. If you'd gone to Rio to that conference on ecology and how can we save this planet, you would have come away like many of them came away, confused and mixed up, discouraged and hopeless. President Kennedy said a quarter of a century ago, no man entering upon this office could fail to be staggered upon learning the harsh enormities of the trials through which he must pass in the next few years. How right President Kennedy was. He went on to say, each day the crisis multiplies, each day their solution grows more difficult, each day we draw nearer the hour of maximum danger, and time is not our friend. In the midst of all these changes, there are certain things that have not changed and will never change. The first thing that has never changed in all these centuries, the nature of God has not changed. He said, I am the Lord, I change not. Malachi 3.6 The scripture says there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning with God. That means the batting of an eyelash. 
Not even that much change in God. In all these centuries, he's from everlasting to everlasting. He had no beginning. He has no end. I don't understand that, but I accept it. He's the one thing that we can count on is God. He's unchanging in his holiness. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is, is and is to come. Revelation 4, 8. God is unchanging in judgment. It says the Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. God is unchanging in love. For God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you. That's hard to believe. That's hard to take in. But God loves you. And if you were the only person in the whole world, God would love you. And we, he would have sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you. God is love. That's one thing I want you to remember when we leave that we've said. And then the second thing, the Word of God has not changed. Not only the nature of God has not changed, but the Word of God has not changed. This Bible is the Word of God. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the Word of our God shall stand forever. And what you read in this book stands forever. It's a thrilling thing to take up this book and know that you're reading something inspired by God and it's his message to the human race. He tells us where we came from. He tells us where we're going. He tells us how to live every day. The third thing that hasn't changed, human nature has not changed. Jeremiah the prophet said, as I said a moment ago, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. Sin means that I've broken God's laws. I've broken the Ten Commandments. If you have broken one commandment one time, you're guilty of all. Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever had lust in your heart? Then you're guilty. We're guilty before God. And because we're guilty, we're under sentence of death. Death in this life and death in the life to come. The way of salvation has not changed. In all these centuries, the way of salvation is still the same. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved in Acts 4.12. John 14.6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. In the last generation, the only way to God was through Christ. In this generation, the only way to God will be through Christ. The only one in history of whom it is written, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Think of it. The wrath of God abides on you now. And the only way that wrath can be turned away is by the cross. When Jesus Christ took your sins on the cross, God could no longer see your sins because your sins were buried in the depths of the sea. And God cannot even remember your sins. Think of it. God cannot even remember. He has the ability to turn the tape recorder off and erase it. And God cannot remember your sins when you come to Christ at the cross by faith and repentance. Yes, God will never change. The Word of God will never change. But you have to change if you are to go to heaven. If you are to have a, a new life here and have purpose and meaning in your life, you have to change. The first thing you have to do is repent. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, the scripture says. The second thing is to believe, and that word believe means to commit. That's the marriage vow that we take. It's not just getting married, it's a lifetime commitment. My wife is here tonight, and she... Uh,
And uh, we've had differences, like every normal couple. And someone asked her, had she ever thought of divorce? She said, no, but I have thought of murder. <laughs> I don't know where she's sitting. But sometime I'm going to ask her to explain that. But we have a wonderful marriage and we have a wonderful family and all of them know the Lord for which we give thanks to God. Now I want to ask you, do you know Christ? You see, Christ died for you. And on that cross, God laid on him the sins of us all. We deserved hell. We deserved judgment. We deserve to pay the price for our sins. But Jesus took them voluntarily on the cross. And on that cross, he had the capacity, because he was the God-man, to see you sitting here tonight. He looked ahead these thousands of years, and he could see you, and he knew you, and he knew all about you, and he loved you, and he's willing to forgive you and give you purpose and meaning in your life and change your life. Your life has to change. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Have you come to Christ? Has there been a time when you received him as your Lord and your Savior and said, Lord, with your help, I want to follow you. I'm going to read the Bible and I'm going to pray and I'm going to be as faithful to you as I can I can't live the Christian life alone. I'm a failure. Billy Graham cannot live the Christian life. I've tried. I can't do it. But with the help of the Word of God and the help of the Holy Spirit, I can live the Christian life. But He lives it through me. He produces the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, and joy and peace. All of these things are supernaturally produced in you by the Holy Spirit when you receive Christ. Some people say, I'm trying to hold on. You don't need to hold on. He holds you. Just turn loose and let Him come into your heart. How many of us, we've been baptized? We go to church once in a while, maybe every Sunday. But deep in your heart, there's a doubt that you know Christ. You're not sure that if you died at this moment, you'd go to heaven. You want to be sure. You want to be certain. You want to know that your sins are forgiven. And you want to know that purpose and meaning that God can give to you. Are you willing to change your way of living? That's repentance, to change your mind, to change the direction of your life. And you can't repent by yourself. The Holy Spirit has to help you do that. And then you come by faith, and faith means commitment. When I stepped on this platform last night, I'd never been on this platform before. I didn't get down and examine it to see if it would hold me up. I accepted by faith that the carpenters had built it built it to hold a man. And by faith, you receive Christ in the same way. You totally commit yourself. You say, Lord, I'm not trusting anything else to save my soul except Jesus. I commit myself to Him. Young people today are looking for a cause. They're looking for a flag to follow. They're looking for something to really believe in. People are mixed up. They're confused. They don't know what to think. They're just angry. And many people think, can we hold together as a society? Come to Christ. He will meet all those longings and all those needs and give you a new life. He can come into your family. He can come into that office where you've been having trouble. He can come into your schoolroom. He can come into every phase of your life 
and make you a new person. He can make those ends meet. He can help you meet those payments. He can help you in looking for a job. He can give you total assurance that your sins are gone and that God will never hold you accountable for them again. They're forgiven. And he receives you with open arms. And he'll do it tonight if you let him. And I'm going to ask you to do something we saw hundreds of people do last night. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I want Christ to come into my heart. I want him to take all of me. I surrender my life to him. And I say, Lord Jesus, I am willing to repent of my sins and turn by faith to you and put my total confidence and my total faith in you. He died on the cross and shed his blood for you. And certainly you can come and take a stand here for him. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. That's the reason I ask people to come forward. Every person Jesus called in the New Testament, he called publicly. Every one. You look and see. There was one, Nicodemus, came by night. But those that made their commitment to Christ came publicly. I'm going to ask you to come publicly and receive him as your Lord and your Savior and your Master. You come right now. We're going to wait on you. Just as hundreds here have responded to the invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can too, wherever you are. Just call the number on your screen right now. Special friends want to help you with this most important decision you can ever make. So don't wait. Call now. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. It's Anne. She's in trouble. If you don't take it to the edge every chance you get, you're dead already, baby. I was in trouble and I didn't know what to do. Where are the Jews? I knew that I could take on the world. It's like you're in a dream, but not really a dream, this is a reality. I don't really believe in all this, but I know something crazy is happening right now.